Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. And uh, Toto's Reflections has been one of those little side projects that you get engaged in. And I'm a student of leadership. Um, I aspire to be a good leader, and I continue to work on it every day. And I know that I have difficulty with it, but it's one of those things you aspire to and you, keep, you have to work on. So the book uh, is about the leadership lessons that are embedded within the Wizard of Oz story. So anyway, it's a lot of, this was a lot of fun to create. Uh, today's panel is very exciting. And uh, we've pulled together some really uh, good folks to participate in this discussion about the future of informatics. Um, of late, I've been telling people that, you know, that, uh, and, and when Gil and I sat down uh, when I was going through my interview process uh, to come on board as the president and CEO of AMIA, one of the things that we discussed and one of the things that I shared with him is that I really felt, uh, he asked me, you know, why are you interested in this position? And I replied that this is the decade of informatics. This is the time when we, as uh, from all of the various aspects of informatics, all the way from the research to the operational side, public health side, where we are going to have the opportunity to help transform healthcare. And I really believe the transformation of healthcare relies upon all of us as informaticians. So it is a very, very exciting period. I recently observed that uh, we are at the very formative stages, however, of where informatics is at. As a matter of fact, I remember in 1973, when I started medical school, we had a two-day course, a two-day course throughout the entire four years of medical school, a two-day course on genetics. Can you imagine having a two-day course in 2013 and surviving as a, as a clinician, of any type of clinician? It just doesn't work. As we look forward to the future of informatics, the same thing's going to happen to our field. We as a matter of fact, those discussions have been precipitated. I've been involved in some discussions, for example, with the AAMC. And what is uh, the core curriculum that we can integrate into the curriculum of medical school? And it's not just medical school, it's nursing, it's pharmacy, it's all of the healthcare professions. And that discussion is now beginning to occur. So uh, this afternoon, what we would like to do is share some thoughts and perspectives on the, the future of, uh, of informatics. Uh, to my immediate right is Gil Cooperman. Gil is a physician and is at New York Presbyterian. He is the uh, head of uh, inter uh, inf interoperability informatics uh, for the institution. And, um, and he's also the chair of the board of AMIA. And so he comes to us with a very rich perspective, uh, both for academics and also very much on the operational side as well. Uh, to his right is Rosemary Kennedy. Rosemary is, uh, more recently she was working at the National Quality Forum, but she is now here in Philadelphia. She's working at both Jefferson in, in charge of uh, strategic initiatives for the School of Nursing, but she also does uh, consulting through her own company called eCare Informatics. And then to Rosemary's right is Mark Overhage. Mark is a physician PhD. Uh, Mark is uh, also with Siemens now, and previously with Regan Streif, and has, is well known to many of us over the years and has done lots of work in the field of informatics, has really been one of the people that's helped create the field as well. So what we thought we would do this afternoon is we're gonna have each person sort of present their perspective on the future of informatics and then we have a uh, discussion and we really want to encourage all of you to uh, engage us in that dialogue. So any questions are valid, you can throw anything at us and we're looking forward to the discussion and the dialogue this afternoon. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gil, and we'll kick off our session. Gil. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel, and thanks for uh, to thanks all of you for for being here. Uh, it's fun to just you know uh, kind of to, to to contrast with research. It's it's fun to just kind of tip the head back and go ah the future. What might that look like? So uh, it's, it's fun to do something uh, uh, a, a little bit different uh, uh, for, for this uh, session today. So uh, you know, just a few framing uh, uh, comments. Um, you know, one philosopher here, uh, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, and then a, a comment here, uh, William Gibson, the, the, the author, uh, science fiction author, 
uh, about 20 years said, you know, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And, and we'll come back to this, and I think this is important for, uh, for informatics. And uh, Alan Kay, a computer scientist uh, um, at, at the time out at uh, Xerox Park, said, uh, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And, and you know, maybe what I'm going to be talking about today is, you know, kind of not so much my predictions for the future, but my aspirations for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you know, that really involves all of you uh, as, as well. So, um, you know, hopefully some of the things I'll be talking about here, some of you will kind of uh, take up the mantle on uh, and move forward. So, you know, as I was thinking about this, I said, you know, I, I, I spoke to the Oracle and I said, oh, oh, Oracle, tell me, you know, what, what areas will advance, you know, significantly over the next five or 10 years in informatics? And the Oracle spoke to me and came up with this list and said, you know, natural language processing, you know, mining data for new knowledge, terminologies, data representation, usefulness of clinical decision support, using IT to support clinical workflow, integration across, across distributed systems, data architectures, information modeling, informatics support for clinical research, greater use of protocol-based care, interdisciplinary care, including nursing and other disciplines, uh, improvements in clinical documentation, M health, mobile health, and involvement of the patient. And uh, you know, the, the, the article that uh, I spoke to was the the program for for this conference. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I kind of wanted to, to to mention this by way of you know congratulating really the uh, you know the, the the conference organizers and and the conference presenters and and, and all of you for kind of having the interest. And um, you know, and, and attending and, and thinking about these important areas. I mean, I think this does represent really a, a terrific cross section of the areas that are in development right now. And you know, and it's you know, it, it, it's important because I I think we you know we then get back to um, kind of the William Gibson comment about the futures here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And you know, there, there's some you know some sobering. Uh, you know, examples of, of informatics innovations that uh, have been developed and are kind of not yet in widespread use. And, you know, I guess a, at least a couple times today that, that comment about, oh, you know, it sometimes takes 17 years for, uh, you know, innovations to find their way into, into routine use, you know, and if it was only 17, you know, we'd be thrilled, you know, with some of these things. You know, but uh, I mean, just some of these things here, you know, uh, preventive health reminders, I'm thinking of Clem McDonald's paper from 1976, still, you know, not in widespread use. Uh, Scott Evans' uh, paper on the antibiotic advisor in the New England Journal, 1998. You know, dosing advice, uh, not yet in widespread use. Clinical decision support, still a long way to go. Natural language processing, uh, you know, been around for a while. Alerts for uh, critical lab results, Karen Tate out in Utah in the mid-90s, uh, Regional Health Information Exchange, you know, Mark Overhage and others at uh, Regan Street from the 90s. So, you know, yes, we have to invent things, uh, but, you know, we also need to think about how we're going to um, uh, 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 disseminate, them, disseminate them broadly. So um, I wanted to refer to uh, an article that appeared about six weeks ago in, in, in Jamia, and uh, the, the the title of the article was The Wave Has Finally Broken, Now What? And it's by Don Simborg, uh, Ida Werner, and, and Don Detmer. And they, they were kind of building an article, an article they wrote in 2005 where they, they, they kind of said, will the wave finally break? And at that time, adoption of EHRs was at about the 10% level. And um, in, in the article, they, you know, they, they note high tech and uh, you know, recount its impact that, you know, increased adoption and there's various numbers floating around for adoption and uh, this, this is, sorry, <laughs> um, this is, uh, you know, from a CMS fact sheet uh, that came out uh, uh, last week, I think, 44% uh, of eligible providers have actually received meaningful use funding. Uh, so, you know, I think that's uh, uh, pretty impressive. A national infrastructure, looking at uh, health exchange, improved quality for meaningful use, increased use of patient portals, and an increase in the skilled uh, workforce. So these are all kind of the, the impact of high tech. And then, and then they, the, the authors kind of in, invoke this, uh, this image of, you know, a breaking wave and you, you still have turbulence. There's turbulence in the wave and there's some residual turbulence. 
And uh, some of the items here are, you know, a poor usability, uh, a, a distrust of EHR notes, a lack of interoperability, slow adoption of decision support, market fragmentation, uh, potential for fraud and abuse. And, and, and even though we've had increase in skilled workforce, there's still insufficient number of uh, trained informaticians. And so then they give um, you know, their predictions for major changes in the next five years. So what they talk about is um, you know, that we'll probably see near universal EHR adoption, uh, advancements in standards and interoperability, increased government involvement in, in health information technology. That exclamation point is mine, not, not the author's. And, um, I mean, healthcare is a pretty regulated industry, and, and I think the, the IT part of it has been relatively unregulated for the last, you know, four decades or so, but might be different going forward, something to think about. And it, it could be positive, you know, or, or, or negative, uh, uh, but, but probably a fact. Uh, they expect breakthroughs in, in user interfaces, more online, educa more online education in general, but for health IT in particular. Uh, clinical decision support for uh, genomics, uh, genomic medicine, and personalized medicine. Uh, a, a learning health system will emerge. Uh, the strengths and weaknesses of big data will, uh, will be better understood. Uh, the, uh, the line between telemedicine and, and the electronic health record will, will blur. And uh, computer-assisted diagnosis, which, you know, had been an active area of study in, you know, 70s and 80s, but you know, over the last couple of decades has kind of uh, uh, tamped down a little bit. They expect this to, uh, to be resurgent. So, uh, you know, I think an interesting, um, you know, set of uh, thoughts here from, from these folks. And uh, another way, I think, to think about the future is to, uh, is to you know, look at AMIA and, and AMIA's working groups. And, you know, I, I list them here. They're kind of in rank order of uh, the, the size of the groups, you know, uh, clinical systems working group has about 1,200, and you know, it just kind of goes goes down from there. But but I, I think you know these represent the areas of interests of the AMIA members, and so you know these are active areas of work, and uh, and uh, and inquiry, and so uh, I think this is uh, another framework to understand how uh, topics may um, advance, you know, over the next uh, five years or so. Uh, you know, in, in these in these domains, and just and just to build on that a, a little bit, you know, another kind of framework to think about uh, things going forward. Um, you know, this is this is uh, Amia's mission here. Uh, you know, five you know five parts of Amia's mission to uh, advance the science of informatics, to offer educational programs, and also support uh, informatics education being done by others. Uh, to assure that information technology is used effectively to promote health and healthcare, uh, to advance the profession of informatics, and then to provide services for our members, uh, networking, opportunities for professional development, things like that. So if we look kind of maybe into, into each of these, uh, you know, apologize a little bit for the small print here, but, but you know, under the science of informatics, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, areas for advancement, you know, translational science, evaluation, creating new knowledge, data mining, analytics, and things like that. But I th you know, in addition to that, I think there may be new models for dissemination of scientific information, uh, you know, open access, uh, and, and uh, other you know, kinds of uh, ways for, for disseminating this, the scientific knowledge that's created under education. Um, there's, there's you know, going to be changes in, in educational modalities, uh, online, distance learning, things like that. Uh, I think there needs to be thoughts about what does the future informatics workforce look like, what kinds of roles are there, and, and how do we educate uh, for those roles, what kind of educational activity should AMIA provide, what, you know, what should other organizations be trying to provide, and AMIA supporting them in those efforts. Um, you know, in assuring that information technology is used effectively to promote health and healthcare, the context here, uh, kind of, I think, as Judy Murphy talked about, is, is, is healthcare reform. And there's, you know, there are policy issues, there, there's implementation science, there's evaluation again. But, uh, you know, I think there's another piece, which is making sure that, that organizations, healthcare organizations, have uh, kind of an informatics capability. And how do we assure that, that, uh, that organizations uh, uh, have that? Um, advancing the profession of informatics, the subspecialty certification was uh, 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 
uh, created uh, within the last year, and uh, those exams, <coughs> that exam is going to be given in, in October, and there's training going on for that right now, uh, and that's for, that's for boarded physicians, and, and there's work going on to uh, have an equivalent certification for folks who are not uh, uh, eligible for that exam, because uh, not everyone is, and, and Amy is uh, uh, you know, working hard on that. And then lastly, uh, providing services for our, our members, networking, professional development. Well, I think one of, the, one of the challenges and opportunities in informatics is, is the diversity. Uh, so you know, there's, there's uh, clinical informatics and public health informatics and, and, and translational bioinformatics, uh, clinical research informatics, and each of these kind of has a domain that's uh, relevant to them, but, but the cross-fertilization uh, makes the field very rich, and figuring out how to, how to manage all that is uh, uh, something we need to work on. So, um, you know, just a, a couple of other random thoughts I couldn't fit in anywhere else. You know, I, th I think international issues are, are very important. Uh, uh, other countries have, you know, different sets of problems, healthcare problems, and, uh, and, and, and because they have less legacy in place, there, there's some different opportunities for innovation there. Uh, and, um, and it'll be interesting to see how that goes. And, and the area of health information technology safety uh, is, um, is, is, is an important area. There's been a new working group created uh, of, of the HIT Policy Committee, and so we'll, we'll see continued work there. And, you know, just, you know, um, you, you know, sometimes we're looking for answers, but, but sometimes I think we have to ask the right questions. And, and I, I, I think that, uh, that, that informatics, um, you know, has, has a healthy focus on, on asking the right questions, uh, as well as trying to get answers. What, what should we be doing with computers? What works? What doesn't? What could be better? How can we use data? What makes a difference? And what's just a bright, shiny object? And so, you know, if we're asking kind of the important questions, then the future will be the same as the past, uh, I think. So that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to say. I think, uh, I think the future is bright. So uh, thanks very much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Gil. That was uh, a lot of fodder there for uh, discussion. So uh, what I'd like to do here is turn it over to Rosemary, who's going to share her perspective as well. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's a Friday afternoon. It's a beautiful day. And the last thing you want me doing is going through my slide deck, which is about 90 slides. <laughs> Kevin called me about a month ago and, and said, um, would, you know, asked if I would participate in this panel, and I, I made the mistake of saying yes, because you can never say no to Kevin. And then he said, um, we're going to talk about the future of informatics, and you have uh, 10 minutes. I said, okay, that's good. So I thought that was an easy thing. 10 minutes is easy, it's small. And then I started to think about it, and it was really, really difficult uh, to cram the future of informatics into um, 10 minutes. So there are three major um, thoughts and perspectives that I have on the future of informatics. So it's not to walk through everything related to informatics, but to reflect back on the past a little bit and think about where we're going in the future. And I can remember a day, you know, 20 years ago, um, unfortunately, given my age, it, it's, it's, maybe it's even 30 years ago, when we were talking about informatics, we'd be talking about data, structures, representation of data, information, and knowledge in the electronic health record. And now, and in the future, when we talk about informatics, it's not just about HIT, it's not just about data information and knowledge. We're talking about public policy, we're talking about organizational culture, we're talking about process re-engineering. And in some respect, if we think about HIT and informatics and how it has advanced, it's really surpassed um, these other areas, public policy, organizational culture, workflow. And I think we're even learning that with me in within meaningful use. So in some respects, when we talk about informatics and for everything we do related to the science, we need to take these other variables into consideration because they're very important. Currently, the um, AMIA Nursing Informatics Work Group is working on a model trying to put all of these components together in a framework that makes sense. So I just put that out there for your thoughts and certainly to critique during our discussion. But for every conversation we have about data, information, and knowledge, we need to have a corollary conversation about policy, organizational culture, workflow, clinician impact, and how they're adopting all of this science that we're putting into place. As we know with the trends, 
We're seeing an increase in data velocity. It's coming at us fast and furiously. It's varied, the information. I was working on a research project at Thomas Jefferson University and went to visit a patient for a home care visit and they had a Fitbit and they had all sorts of information in the Fitbit, their sleep patterns and everything. They uploaded it to some public domain, domain public health record and they thought just like that, that the home care nurse would be integrated into the home care system because they were going for a physician office, office visit the following week and wanted all this information in. And I think as we look at this speed, volume of data, velocity, variety coming at clinicians in addition to meaningful use, the third area as we think about the future, it raises all sorts of new issues that we haven't even potentially thought about. Validity of data, reliability of the data, ethical issues. I was, um, had a conversation earlier today, true confessions, I, I had a bullet on a slide uh, talking about ethics and I took it off because I realized I was not qualified and I had not given it enough thought. And in the future, as we move forward, in addition to the framework of thinking about organizational culture, we really need to think about these issues related to ethics because they're coming at us. Genomics, everything, and is, is raises all sorts of, of, of issues. And I think, you know, and this was a quote that I, I often think about and really thought about too at, at the National Quality Forum. I was working on quality measures and defining and pulling this information. Whether it's at the point of care or whether it's quality measures or data mining, extracting all this information from the system, we have larger volumes of it now, which is great, thanks to meaningful use, genomics, nanotechnology, mobile devices. And what we're really trying to do and we'll adapt to in the future is really creating a context in which other people can think. So we're creating a context for thinking. I can easily you know, go into a hospital and get a 15-page um, clinical summary uh, on a patient. It, you know, it doesn't serve much of a purpose. In fact, it's worse than the paper record. But if someone were to serve it up within a context so I can make clinical decisions off of that, that's of real value, whether it's at the point of care or whether it's in a data repository, uh, data warehousing. And another area that we're seeing as we move forward is this whole area of creating um, momentum, uh, mind share, uh, we have public health records, this is patients like me um, with um, close to 200,000 patients over a thousand conditions and just think about it, they don't need a nurse or somebody to chart their outcome, they're publicly sharing them and the power of being able to mine this kind of information so we could advance healthcare, how do we garner all this and, and gather intelligence from it, I think is something that we're just beginning to embark upon and will certainly be part of um, the, the future. So with that, I just want to go back to this model. It's not just about data, information, and knowledge. It's about this broader context of organization, healthcare delivery systems, how are we going to finance and sustain all of this as we move forward uh, post meaningful use and stage two, three, and all the stages that Judy laid out today. And with that, I will hand it over to Mark and uh, welcome your critique and comments in some of those areas. See, I've learned enough about predicting the future that you don't write anything down and then people will remember the good stuff and forget the errors, right? So you guys, <laughs> you guys blew it with the slides. So, so, uh, Interesting topic, uh, you know, of where, where is informatics? I, was interested. I, I had no idea what Gil and, and others, you know, Rosemary were going to say here. And um, less overlap than I would have anticipated, actually. I, you know, you always worry when you have a panel like this with smart people that there's nothing smart left to say. Uh, fortunately, it's such a broad topic that didn't happen, hopefully. But uh, a couple of things I wanted to highlight. First is, and you heard references to this throughout the first sets of comments, is that in some ways, and to borrow Gil's uh, approach here, Yogi Berra quote, you know, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Uh, informatics has, is beginning to fork a little bit more here in the US than it was. You know, I remember uh, many years ago at uh, AMIA, I was on the program committee and they handed out t-shirts and one was for the application track and the other set of t-shirts was for the, the theory track. And in many ways, I think that's becoming more rather than less prominent, not necessarily a bad thing. We need, for all the reasons you just heard from Rosemary and from Gill, we need practitioners who understand the theory, who understand what's known, who understand what can go wrong, 
who are taking the work that people do in the lab, if you will, and making it a reality. And that's not gonna be the HIT vendors doing that for us because they, they can build tools, they can build uh, pieces of that story. But as Rosemary said, you know, this is about social engineering, it's about process redesign, it's about aligning incentives and all those sorts of things. And that is the hard work that has to be done often locally, often different in New York than it is in Pittsburgh, than it is in San Francisco. And, and so the, uh, board certification process, all of the educational efforts that have been going on are, are critically important. It, it's been interesting to me, I've been spending more time with healthcare organizations in Europe over the last um, months than I used to. And uh, working with the hospitals there, it's fascinating because the folks who are driving the health IT in the hospitals are informaticians. Mm -hmm. They're not CIOs, they're not, uh, it, it's a somewhat different flavor. They really are taking that theory and applying it in very direct ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I think that's a, a fruitful and positive thing for us to have happening. At the same time, I fear the other fork in the road, the research fork, the more theory fork, the more academic fork is at high risk right now. The research funding that's available is severely constrained and getting worse, I fear. I really think that, and with the emphasis on the, the application, many people are saying, well, wait a minute, it's easy to go this way over here, there's no money. Hmm, I'm a smart guy. Uh, so I, I think we're at high risk of losing a generation of informaticists as we go forward here. I really am worried that we're not gonna have the laboratories, the environments in which people can be trained and learn at that level. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I think part of it is that uh, commercial organizations who care about this, whether they're health systems, health IT vendors, and others need to be part of that solution and help fund that and support that research. But, but that's probably not the entire answer, but it, it concerns me greatly what the next five to 10 years of, of informatics research looks like given that. The other thing that I think makes that research concerning is, is the success that we're having with deployment of EMRs. Now it may sound kind of funny, but it's back to the, uh, you know, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. As we, we've had the good fortune over the last 20, 30 years, as Gil described, to have locations where systems are in place that informaticians built from the ground up and were able to modify, test, they built relationships with the organizations, and we learned a lot. As we deploy commercial products, again, I think it becomes more difficult to employ that research for a whole variety of reasons, none of them ill-intentioned, but it becomes more challenging to push that envelope and, and drive those kinds of innovative uh, new approaches, new ideas into use. So, so that's a, a significant change, I think, going forward, and, and these efforts, uh, to create ways that vendor platforms can become more accessible, like the SMART project, uh, I, I think are laudable, because we really need that platform sort of approach, not only to enable uh, academic interest and in, in advancing the research, but also, frankly, I think, to enable the limited uh, uh, pool that we have of really smart, capable people spread all over the world who are building applications within their institution, their hospital, their health system that could benefit many others, but very difficult to share and transport to others. So I, I think that that's uh, putting us severely at risk in terms of the research uh, agenda going forward. What their research agenda looks like, and I think Rosemary talked about this a bit, you know, in some ways doesn't change because I think what we continue to do as informaticists is to pull in the best and most interesting from the not quite bleeding edge of other disciplines, whether that's uh, social networking, cognitive psychology, uh, unified communications technologies, predictive modeling, and bring it to bear on the very real problems that we have in healthcare leveraging that insight and understanding we have about how clinical data works, how it's structured, how healthcare processes work. And we're doing that in an environment that I think is increasingly recognized as a complex adaptive system. Well, that creates its own set of problems. Peter Drucker, a number of years ago, described hospitals as the most complex organizations ever invented by man. And this comes from a guy who's looked at industry and factories and manufacturing and logistics organizations across the world. 
And he was just talking about hospitals. If you think about our healthcare delivery system as we're challenged to look beyond the walls of a hospital or beyond the walls of a physician practice and, and look at how patients are cared for in a linear longitudinal way over their lifetime, what care they receive in the home as Rosemary described, uh, how the home care nurse participates in that system and so on, it becomes absolutely mind boggling to think about the opportunities that we have to make that system work because there's no other way to do it beyond uh, information technology at its core. So when you, when you think about the future of informatics, in many ways, it's no different than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, we, we have the same broad vista of opportunities, I think, and in fact, we have some foundation emergingly in place on which to build and leverage that work that all of you do into real patient care, into patient care at scale across not just one physician practice, one emergency room, one hospital, but across health systems and across nations across the world. So thanks very much. Uh, very good. We, we've got a lot of uh, rich opportunity for discussion. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, to kick things off, I'd like to pick up on something that Mark talked about, which is this uh, whole issue that we are facing with uh, a de decline, if you will, in government funding for informatics research. And um, in particular, uh, given the fact that we've got, you know, both somebody who's in the operational side, somebody who's been in the academic side, and somebody who's now on the vendor side, uh, I'd like to have a little deeper discussion around this issue, around the field of informatics and our interaction with industry. What can we do to foster industry's support for the research agenda that, you know, Gil and Rosemary put up there? Uh, because as I look at other industries, as I look at aviation, as I look at automotive, as I look at any number of other industries, industry is intimately involved in the research agenda of those various fields. And I think somehow we need to foster that. So my question for the panel, all of you, all three of you, is how do we support that? How do we foster that? What can we do to generate that kind of support? And you want to punch the button there to turn on the green light. Yeah. Maybe. No, maybe it's on. Uh, on? Yeah, it's on. OK, great. It's on. Well, I'll take a first crack at that since I'm the obvious target. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think it's critical for industry to do more to help drive and support research and organizations that uh, facilitate medical informatics and, and whatever form of informatics you want to name. Uh, because it's frankly the future. Uh, and if we don't, we're in, in trouble. Uh, now, how, what form that can take and how that works, you know, many of you know that, uh, you know, up until about 1980 or so, uh, the only connection between industry and universities was sort of, uh, you know, here's an endowment or here's a whatever, and there were no strings, there were no, and it gets challenging, and, and for any of you who've tried to work with industry, I'm sure you've found it challenging where the time frames are a little bit different, the uh, the, the notion of what kind of things you can produce for what kind of money or maybe not aligned. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not an easy thing. But on the other hand, there are some great examples, as Kevin said, not necessarily from healthcare IT so much, but, but there's some great examples from other fields where very tight relationships have been built that have been highly productive for both the uh, academic organization and the uh, industry organization. Uh, and, there's a number of things you have to do to make that work, including, uh, I think, understanding each other is critically important. Understanding those differences and appreciating those, it's kind of like being married, right? You gotta understand what the other one needs and when they need it and why they need it and, and appreciate that it's not capricious. Uh, the second thing you have to do is, I think, be in it for the long haul. Uh, you know, a, a one-year contract to go produce some research product is not very satisfying for either party, I think. It has to be a long-term relationship. And, and the third thing I think that's critical is really understanding what the other one needs, uh, what the uh, outcomes that they're looking for. And if you have those three things, I think there's great opportunities. And there's a few examples of that in healthcare IT, but we need some more so that we can sort of loosen up the uh, resources to allow more of that to happen. Very good. Yeah, Rosemary? I, I have a question for Mark. Uh, being on both sides of, of the fence in, in my past, uh, working 20 years for a vendor, now being on the university side. We just traded places. Just traded places. And I, 
I see opportunities and, and have on a small scale some projects underway at, at, at Thomas Jefferson University where the vendor comes into the simulation lab and, and it, it's moving input, and this is a question for Mark, more upstream in that development cycle to test some things and get some feedback. Um, I think that some of the IP and issues and the fact that there are two different business models between both entities can be worked around, around something that's contained, you know, not the whole entire electronic health record, but an aspect of something. And the advantage of it is it's not just research and not just getting quantifiable data, but you tend to pull in stakeholders and, and it becomes educational for them. You tend to interact with physicians and interact with, with nurses. So um, I, I sense that the IP and, and the um, business model, um, we can work around them. The challenging part comes to with the funding a little bit. But I think that universities and providers are willing to give a little resources and knowledge and work around this. And, and I think that I, I see it breaking a little bit or opening up. And I don't know if you see that yourself. I agree. <laughs> Gil? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I have any. Uh, oops. Is that on? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I have any. Uh, deep insights uh, beyond the comments that have been made. Uh, I'm at New York Presbyterian Hospital right now, and I'm, I'm adjunct faculty at, at Columbia. And uh, you know, as, we, as we talk about this from a um, you know, from faculty point of view, uh, just to echo you know, some of the things that, um, that Mark has said, that, that, that there is a um, kind of a, a, a different way of, of thinking about it if there are um, uh, you know, if, if, if there are industry relationships that are that, that are going to be uh, pursued, um, you know, I, I, I think you know, I think there's a difference between um, you know, tr trying to speak with large companies um, and um, you know where, where where some of this might be you know strategic and they might be uh, you know uh, you know sp sponsoring you know, or, or willing to sponsor large projects and you know those are long conversations that, that take some time. Versus, uh, you know, small innovative uh, companies, uh, startups, and, uh, and things like that, where there, there's kind of more immediate uh, opportunity to exercise the the technology. I, I think the you know the, the, the challenges and the opportunities are are different in um, in, in in both of those. Um, you know, I I, I, I think there, there there are certain domains that are that are open to. Uh, kind of industry relationships. Uh, I think there are other domains that, uh, unfortunately, are just going to be viewed as kind of basic research, and, and we need to keep advocating for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for strong, strong research funding to uh, to support those things. Um, so I don't know. I'll, just, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Good. Uh, before I go to the audience, which I'm going to go to next, uh, let me ask one more question of the of the panel here. Um, and, and it touches on something that Mark uh, uh, indicated in that the role of the informatician in Europe is different than it is here. And so, Gil, I'm going to start with you on this question. Um, it, it, and this is part of the discussion, Gil, that we had when we had the American College of Medical Informatics meeting uh, this year, where we talked about what is the role of the informatician and how is that changing and what can we do to help foster the use of the informatician. It occurs to me that we are at a very interesting juncture for the field and that we are moving from this massive investment of implementation towards now we have it implemented, now we need to figure out what's there, we need to do the analytics side. And that actually that's going to be the much more important role and the question becomes, are, and in fact I'm asking you in your own organization, are you seeing a shift? in the expectations of healthcare organizations relative to the role of the informatician. And if it is happening, you know, what dynamics do you see around that? Um, so I, I agree that we're, we're at an interesting juncture and there has been a lot of focus on uh, adoption and, and getting the EHR in place. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think there's been, there's been good success on that. And I, I think that uh, organizations like mine are turning their attention to okay, you know, so now how do we solve these mm -hmm. problems that, that that healthcare reform is is is, is putting on us? 
and that uh, it creates a, a few different uh, needs. So w one is, what, what can you do with the EHR? Another is, you know, what, what do you need something other than the EHR to do? And then how do you, you know, take the EHR as one component in, in a broader infrastructure and make that work? And then how do you address the challenges that Rosemary uh, talked about, you know, the organizational and, uh, and things like that? And so um, that kind of next step be be beyond the EHR, making use of it in a, a broader environment, um, re requires a, a, a complex set of skills. And whereas maybe, you know, just implementing the EHR might not have been an informatics challenge per se, mm -hmm. making use of the EHR right. in a broader environment to, you know, yeah. uh, to, to, to realize all these goals, folks with informatics experience, I, I think, are being appreciated, and, you know, subtly and in different ways being brought into the, the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Great. Rosemary? Mark? I see the role being decentralized a lot just in the facility that, that, that I work in, you know, it, a need to have informatics in a centralized location with specific roles. But in analyzing, and, and we just recently did this and looked across the various departments, case management, quality, research across the street from the hospital, we are finding that, um, and I don't know if they're formal informatics roles, but they're involved in informatics domain spaces as they're trying to pull information from a database, as they're doing research, as they're providing education, as they're trying to do case management, and a real appreciation that it, it, it's bigger than just the electronic health record, it's a case <coughs> management system, it's a finance system. So right. the struggle is now, and I, I'd yeah. like to open it up to the audience, there, there are those that are um, truly um, educated, trained in, in, in informatics, and those that are, I don't know, they're coming up close against the, the informaticians, you know, the, the folks that I worked with at CMS on, on quality measures are looking at data, they're looking at representation, they're turning it into information and knowledge. And um, I don't know what the answer is, but they're getting pretty close to, you know, to that specialty of, of informatics. Yeah. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. I, I think the question is, is when decisions start getting made and, and directions set by folks who don't understand the, the core issues, they're certainly learning how complicated and hard those, those issues are. Um, you know, I'm not sure, Kevin, if I, if I understood your question right, you know, part of it was, you know, do we, are we, is it time to move on from the EMR to sort of analytics, healthcare intelligence, whatever you want to call it, and, and I don't think so. I, I think we still have many, many fundamental challenges uh, in how the uh, transactional tasks that we have to do for healthcare are executed. For example, um, my wife's a general pediatrician, uses a, you know, a well-regarded commercial EMR in her practice, and she curses it every single day, uh, to the point I get really tired of hearing it. Uh, and I'm glad it's not ours, because I'm sure it would be just as valid a criticism. <laughs> So, but, but, you know, the, the number one uh, uh, hate, if you will, of EMRs by clinicians is, you know, it takes too long to do the work, to doc in particular to document. Uh, the fact that we, by and large, while there's EMRs out there in many places now, not as many as you might like, but many, uh, how much good are they doing for the patient? Uh, and I, I think that's, the jury's still out on that. And I think that part of that is because of this, yeah, you've got the platform, but there's real work to do to make the process improve, to make the education, to make the communication work. Our existing EHRs don't support collaboration and communication among care team members, both formal and informal, in ways that are needed. And, and maybe that should be done in a different system, I wouldn't argue with that, but, uh, you know, so I think that it's, it's I certainly wouldn't throw in the, uh, towel and say that EMRs are a solved problem. Right. Uh, at the same time, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity in taking better advantage of the data that are being generated today, uh, in part because that's the only way we're going to improve that data that's being generated, because most of it's garbage. Yep. Uh, and the only way we're going to get it better is by trying to use it as best we can today, recognizing its, its uh, flaws, and then uh, working backwards to fix them. So I think that's a very important part of the step, but boy, I'd sure not, uh, not be ready to, to 
throw away the basics yet because they just yeah. don't think we've got the nail. Oh, I would agree with you. As a matter of fact, I think you know there is a, there's a couple of core issues that informaticians are going to be central to solving, and that's like interoperability. <laughs> we've been talking about that for how many years? Uh, use of standards. Uh, there's there's a bunch of issues that I agree on the implementation side that are very important. Rosemary, you mentioned uh, the diffusion issue. Um, I bring us back to my metaphor of genetics. Um, you know, there's, ge there's genetics specialist, but there's also genetics that's part of the fabric of how we do business. It was interesting, about uh, three, four weeks ago, I ran into a CEO friend of mine who's a CEO of a very large healthcare system. And he said to me, Kevin, you know, we really need to train our frontline people on what informatics is all about so they even understand how to ask questions. And I thought that was an interesting comment. And uh, he, he was suggesting that we need to get involved in helping to make that happen. And I think he's probably right, that we do have a role there in trying to help our uh, brothers and sisters uh, who are in the clinician role understand what informatics is really all about. So with that, I'd like to, Tony's got the microphone, and we'd like to, we got a hand, couple hands up, so. Um, so my question, I know parallel to your question, Kevin, about, about integrating with industry, mm -hmm. um, but I think one trend that you can't really argue against is the uh, increasing awareness of patients that informatics is a thing, that health IT is happening. Yep. Um, and my question to all of you is, what are, what are the opportunities and the challenges that you see for implementations as that trend develops? Who would like to go first on that one? Rosemary. I'll, I'll go first with just the, the one aspect to that. The, the opportunity is, is, is obviously education <coughs> and engagement because if there's exchange of information and they're entering information, they're more aware. Of. And the research project that I mentioned, the quality measures are integrated into the discharge summary. So when the patients go home, you're looking at the endorsed quality measures as, as part of meaningful use. And, and many of them, a, a lady age 92 went to page 15 of the discharge report and said, gee, at a minimum, I thought they were doing this. You know, but at least there was exchange and dialogue related to the information. There is a pilot underway with um, a couple of major vendors at a clinic where patients are interacting with their plan of care. And they're, you know, seeing it, they're updating it, and then they get follow-up and, and requests to show whether they understand the plan of care or not. And if they say they don't, then an alert clinical decision support goes back to the nurse practitioner or the physician to say, gee, you sent them out and they really thought they understood their meds and they don't. Somebody needs to intervene. <coughs> and all of that is good. Um, I, I think the downside and the challenging part is not everybody has a, a, a phone, let alone access to something that's electronic for this information flow. And how, how do we pull those, you know, that population into the mix? So. And there are probably there are ethical challenges in terms of the information that gets gets entered in. Um, my mother had an inpatient admission and, and got a copy of her chart and uh, was reading it and was somewhat offended by some of the information that was in there. So you know, just those kinds of things. But all in all, it's good. I don't mean to imply it's not good, but it does raise some challenges. Other thoughts? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Walt. Very good, very good presentation. Um, the question that's on my mind this week about this is, currently we're looking at EMR, the data, the tools, the packages, and help us as tools in the clinician toolbox. Mm -hmm. The vision of artificial intelligence to drive patient care and a toolbox are two distinct opportunities. It seems like the lines are getting blurrier in that is IT going to be the intelligence to drive the practice, or is the practice to be driven to the clinician with IT as a tool to support the practice? I know I'm here on my side, so I'm not wanting to do more, so I'm not going to do less. Genetics is bringing all kinds of great opportunities with how we can invent new rules to help them guide down the path of care. It, it seems like we have to make sure that the two lines get too blurry and lose. <laughs> It is that patient care. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think yeah, I, I think we're at a um, 
at an in interesting time, you, you know, and, and I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the Meaningful Use Program strives to, to, to roll out a, a foundational platform, and then that interesting things will, will happen on top of that platform, and I, I think that we're kind of in the middle of that. We've got, like, one tower of the bridge built, and we don't have cars, you know, going across yet, you know. But, but, but I, you know, so, so uh, I, I think there's, you know, some, some of that needs to happen in terms of the ubiquity of the, the platform. I, I think some evolution of the standards so that, that da data is accessible. And then I, I think there, there are opportunities for uh, componentry to be added on top of that platform that then en enable uh, the, the, the care improvements, whether it's decision support or, or suggestions or, um, workflow support uh, and, and things like that. I, you know, I, I think that's still the vision that we're we're working towards. We're just kind of in the middle of, you know, kind of you know, like we're rolling out the carpet, you know, across the living room. We can't really have the cocktail party just yet. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that you know we'll get the platform in there that that the, the, the APIs and, and the access to the data will happen and then you know the, the you know the innovation and, and uh, you, you know folks who, who, who have great ideas and you know can, can provide workflow support will be able to do to bring that part of it as well. Good. Yeah. The, um, you know I think the, the question you asked about sort of is practice going to drive the electronics or electronics going to drive the practice? I think we're a long way from where the electronics are going to drive the practice, um, in large part because these are very, very complex systems. Now, having said that, I think that there is a great deal more that we can do than we're doing today to have help in the things that are simple and obvious. In other words, you don't have to deal with a complex, sophisticated patient necessarily to, uh, to be a help to the physician and the, and the patient in their care. Um, there, there was um, a physiologist in 1912 at uh, Johns Hopkins who said, you know, this was the turning point in medicine. It was the first time that a random patient seeing a random physician for a random condition had a better than 50% chance of getting better. Uh, you know, and then I think about Beth and Flynn's study in 2003, it went up to 55%. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of what we might think of as just routine stuff that doesn't happen well, that I think systems can be a tremendous help for making sure the patient gets their flu shot, uh, you know, that information is communicated, that things don't fall through the cracks. Uh, but, but when it gets to sort of the, okay, what's, what's the, how do you weigh the patient's preferences along with the uh, uh, highly variable and incomplete data set that drives the decision, you know, we, we got a long way to go before we're there. So I, I think we take advantage of the tools to drive the simple things. And, uh, and, and, and so it's really the you know, practice, practice driving the system in my mind. But. Very good. I think we've got time for one more question. And I saw a hand in the back. Yeah. Wow, well, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, I should tell you, I'm a librarian from uh, Medical University Library. All day, I've been listening to people asking, we've got all this data. How are we going to collect it? How are we going to organize it? How are we going to make it accessible? Down to, how are we going to teach them how to ask the right questions? Both Dr. Seuss said, we're here, we're here, we're here. But I would like to know what your perspective is on the, the role of libraries and librarians in terms of providing some access. Thoughts? Um, is anybody here from Thomas Jefferson University? I don't want to tell tales, but um, one of the CIOs is, is, is a librarian. Um, one of the best implementation projects that I, I, I ever worked on in terms of um, outcomes was in 1988, and the CEO said, um, we're going to put the librarian on the implementation team. I, I was younger than I am now, in 1988, and I really thought that the um, CEO was, was senile. I, I thought, that I can't believe we're going to, why are we going to put the librarian on the implementation team? But the most successful implementations in, in my um, 25, 30 years is when somebody from library science was, was, was on the team. Just the discipline, uh, it, it, it's somewhat obvious. 
And I can only speak to my personal examples, but um, it's much needed and, and always had a great outcome. I mean, I, I, um, I'll, I'll just add that, uh, you know, certainly in terms of uh, uh, ed education and, um, uh, you know, how we uh, uh, teach, uh, uh, you know, physicians or nurses or, or any health professionals to, uh, to, to, to access data and to, and to make decisions kind of in, in, in the context of care. And we're, you know, and, you know, and we're educating them about that and then providing them systems to be able to uh, have access uh, in, in that context. I, I think those, those kinds of principles are, uh, are, are, are critically important. And, and so, you know, and as, especially around the, um, the education and making sure folks know how to uh, access data appropriately. So I, th I think those, those, those are the context in which, uh, context in which we, we run up against it at, at our place. So um, with, I, I just add my thoughts on that. About uh, two months ago, I met with the leaders of the uh, national, I forget the technical name of the association, but it's the Association of Health Sciences Librarians. Like and we met in Washington, DC, and uh, had a discussion around collaboration. One of the things that we're doing at AMIA is we are really reaching out very actively to other associations to try to figure out how we can work with them because it seems like everybody wants to talk about informatics. <laughs> And so they're turning to AMIA as uh, one of the places that they turn to because we're the home of the informatics professionals. So in that discussion, we did in fact have a, a very good conversation about the very important role that librarians play in this field. And in fact, as we are beginning this discussion, and it is at the formative stages, a discussion of what is the core curriculum of informatics that needs to be embedded in all the health sciences, not just medicine, not just nursing, not just pharmacy, but all of the health professions, library sciences is going to be at the table. And uh, so we're kind of excited about that. Uh, just a final comment, and then uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Tony. Uh, I just want to, uh, this is a commercial, Tony, I hope that's okay. Uh, it, the board of directors of AMIA this uh, last year made a decision to start a new conference. And so we are having our first conference on iHealth in January of 2014 iHealth is I to the sixth power. It's about taking individual information, applying informatics to create intelligence that drives innovation to improve healthcare. Sort of the discussion we've been having. And so I hope that uh, all of you will think about that as a possible venue for looking very much uh, at the research that we should be applying tomorrow morning. I mean, we should be taking home lessons and saying, you know, we're gonna go back home and do this tomorrow morning. So that's what iHealth is all about. And then finally, I just want to invite all of you to the reception that is going to be held on the top floor at 5 o'clock. Uh, we're having our kickoff of the Mid-Atlantic uh, AMIA chapter. This is the first chapter in the nation, uh, although we've already got our second chapter being requested. And I actually know that there's a bunch of other communities that are also talking about it. So we're probably going to have, in a very short period of time, five, six chapters around the nation. And the intent is to really uh, try to do more at the regional level and, and support the profession uh, at the regional level. So I invite all of you to come. Hope you uh, are going to be there. I know that our panelists are going to be there. So if there are more questions, I'm sure that they'd be willing to engage in conversation. Thank you very much. Tony.